स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया which you are going to frequently use in this course so first of all uh, let me begin by um, assuming that omega we will i'll write omega like this and this is an open and connected open and connected subset of rn okay so n will be the dimension and omega we will always assume in this course whenever i am saying omega just assume that omega is open connected subset of rn okay so definitely omega can be rn but uh, generally speaking it is a subset of rn okay and it is open and connected we also call this side of the set as a domain okay we also call it as a domain now with this omega what we can do is we can define many simple notations and the first notation which i am going to use is you see we are going to use del omega okay this is the first notation and the second notation so basically we are talking about notations here notations okay so del omega del omega is denoted by the boundary of omega so essentially what i mean is it is you take the closure of omega and you subtract omega from it so minus omega so basically a set which are in omega bar but not in omega that i am calling as a boundary so for example let's say that uh, if say omega is b01 okay b01 so which is set of all those mod x less than 1 and uh, then Uh, your boundary del omega will be the set of all those mod x which is equals to 1 right okay so that's in, this is the notation which you are using and uh, we will also follow this thing so let's say we will say that u okay so u whenever i'm writing this will be a function this is defined from omega to r okay so whenever i'm writing omega i am saying it is a subset of rn open connected subset so u is from omega to r i will just write and uh, this is given by this so, so you see u of x x i am taking from omega okay so this it actually looks like this u x1 x2 x of n yes and this x is in omega okay and we say we say u is smooth smooth if u is infinitely differentiable see differentiable okay okay so whenever we say infinity differentiable and all we mean that uh, you can uh, i mean derive this thing you can take the derivative of this thing infinitely many times now coming to that what we can also say is we denote denote u x i we write u x i okay to be del u del x i so this is the partial derivative of u in the i the direction okay so this is essentially i mean you guys already know this is limit h tends to 0 u of so let's say this is at the point uh, i mean some point p okay so u of p plus h e i minus u of p by h okay so if if the limit exists that is if the limit Exist. So this is the partial derivative. So this is the partial derivative of u. Partial 
to derivative in the ith direction okay ith direction right okay you can also define similarly del u del gamma so this is the let's set the point p okay so this will this is the directional derivative we call it a directional derivative derivative of u at the point p in omega in the direction gamma okay gamma is also a direction in r n so essentially this i mean you can define it like this limit raise tends to zero u of x plus h gamma minus uh, this is at the point p no this is p minus u of p by h okay obviously if it exists I'm assuming that, okay. So I mean the state of change of u in the direction gamma, right? So if gamma is i, so if gamma is i, then of course uh, del u by del gamma is del u by del x i, okay? And uh, we also denote denote gradient of u to be u of x. One, u of x two, u of x n. Okay, so you take all the partial derivatives together in a vector like this, and that will be denoted by gradient of u. Okay, with this notation, del u by del gamma at the point p can be written as gradient of u at the point p dot gamma. Okay, so this can be Achieved using the definition like this. Okay, so uh, I mean you can also write del u by del gamma as this. Obviously, I mean you need the regularity on u, but uh, I mean we'll assume that for now. Okay, so let us look at some other things. We define u plus. Okay. U plus is defined as the maximum of u and zero. Okay, and similarly, u minus is defined as the minimum of sorry minus minimum of u and zero. Okay, and hence you can write u to be u plus minus u minus. Both of these are positive functions, and you can be written as a Uh, I mean, product. Uh, sorry, sum of two positive functions. Similarly, mod u will be u plus plus u minus. You can check this; it's very easy to check. Okay, so this is another thing, and uh, we'll also define an average. Okay, so this is the average of u, uh, let's say, over omega. Okay, so how we define? We write it like this: average of u okay over omega so let's say this d y so this so u of y d of y i am not writing u of y so this is this means that this is you write the let's say this is measure of omega you take the integral of u dy over omega take this whole uh, integral and then divide it out with the measure of omega that will give you the average of u over omega okay so this is the average of u over omega and uh, obviously i mean generally we assume that the measure of omega is positive in this okay But otherwise i mean this will blow up okay and uh, we also write uh, we say that u is a uh, lipschitz continuous okay in omega if so basically lipschitz continuity is not in a single point but in a omega so this is a 
non local concept okay if there exists m positive such that mod ux minus uy this is less than equal m times mod x minus y for all xy in omega and note this m is independent of x and y okay so this depends on omega of course but i mean it does not it can be less than equals to it does not depends on x and y so basically you can change x and y but this m is not going to change okay so as an example let's take an example look at an example example you can take f of x to be x square on let's say 0 1 okay of course you can see that fx minus f of y this is can be written as less than equal x minus y times x plus y okay which is less than equal 2 times mod x minus y right and this 2 this is your m here okay so this is this is continuous on the other hand on the other hand other hand you see if f of x is x square on r so basically what i am what i mean is f is from r to r given by f x equals to x square okay so basically f from r to r given by f x equals to x square then what happens is one can show show f is not Lipschitz continuous right because you know in that case you cannot get a bound on this thing here i am bounding so here what we are doing is mod x plus y is less than equal mod x plus mod y right and this is less than equal two times the maximum of let's say mod uh, z such that z is in close zero one right and this is definitely one right so this is two so this becomes two and that's why this is two but in this case what happens is if you are taking your domain to be r i do not have a control on x and y it can be as big as possible so it can there cannot be a m which dominates this whole thing for any x y clear okay so now we want to talk about notations for derivatives so we in the last part we saw that we can define the partial derivative of u and now what happens is we define a some new concept called the multi index notation okay multi index notation now what is the multi index notation so we say alpha equals to alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha n this is a vector okay a vector of this form uh, so that alpha i is always greater than equal zero is called a multi index multi index of order of order whatever you want to call it let's say mod alpha okay mod or mod alpha so mod alpha is summation alpha i i cost 1 to n this is called a multi index so essentially what we are talking about is any vector alpha which is given by alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha n but the condition is all the alpha is must be non negative and that is called a multi index essentially a vector with this uh, form of this form and the order of the multi index the order of the multi index is given by mod alpha where mod alpha is the sum of alpha is yes right now with this notation so now the question is why do we suddenly introduce a notation like this this is introduced because let's say uh, i want to talk something like this so let's say del uh, 7 something uh, u pi del x1 del x2 square something like this um, let's say 5 huh? I want to talk about this and uh, I mean 
you can understand that the more partial derivative it has, uh, the more clumsy. So this is a very clumsy looking notation, like looking notation. And uh, you can think of it like, uh, let's just say, if I'm changing 7 to 10 or 11, 12, uh, this gets more uh, bulkier and clumsier, right? We do not want this thing. So this is not recommended. That is why we introduce something called the multi-index notation, okay? So let's uh, erase this thing. And we come back to the multi-index notation. What? As we explained, multi-index is a vector which looks like this. And uh, with this, we are going to define a new thing. So given, given a multi-index, multi-index, given a multi-index, okay? And uh, alpha define, define d alpha of u x, okay? This we define as del mod alpha of u x by x1 alpha 1. Xn alpha n. So essentially what happens is basically you are looking at the alpha partial derivative, mod alpha partial derivative and uh, x1 has to be alpha 1 times and xn has to be alpha n times. So this is all linked. Alpha 1 is linked with x1, alpha 2 is linked with x2 and alpha n is linked with xn. So basically the ordering of this vector is very important and we can also write it like this. Del x1 alpha 1 del xn alpha n of u of x, okay? So that's your multi-index. Let's take an example and see what it means. Let's say u is from r2 to r, okay? u is from r2 to r and uh, alpha is uh, 1, 0. Let's see what happens to uh, d alpha of u. So this is, you can see, this is d of 1, 0 of u this should look like del u because mod alpha is 1 plus 0 which is 1 by del c the first one is for x1 okay so this is x1 1 and 0 is for del x2 which is 0 so that is not there okay so we are not going to write it this it is del u del x1 similarly you can take another example Let's say uh, the same u, u is from R2 to R, let's say, R2 to R, and alpha is 1, 2, okay? In this case, d alpha of u, it should look like del 1 plus 2 is 3, okay? Del x1, del x2, square. So it should look like this, okay? So that's your multi-index notation. Now we can continue with this thing. So let's say k is greater than or equal to zero and we can write dk of u. So what is it? This is the set of all, this is the set of all d alpha of u x such that, okay? Uh, obviously, this is the way x here. I mean, it doesn't matter, but um, you can just write it like this. Mod alpha is equals to k, right? So basically, dk of u is the alpha. So when the order of alpha, the multi-index is k, okay? All those partial derivatives, we are looking at it and putting it in a set that is your dk of ux. So for example, let's say, for example, okay? u again, I'm starting with r2 to r, okay? And uh, dk, I'm talking about, I want to write what is du of x. du of x in this case will be a set which contains u of x1, u of x2, right? It should contain like this. Uh, and, uh, but generally what happens is we also uh, write the gradient of u gradient of u if you remember it is uh, gradient of u of x we write it like gradient of u of x this is du of x right this is du of x and that is given by we also write it like this right u x1 u x2 so 
So you see, whenever we talk about gradient, we write it like a vector, ux1 and ux2. This is a vector. And we identify this. This is an identification. Okay, We identify this with d of u, which is like a set which contains ux1 and x2. So this is an identification that's all. Okay, So we can just think of it like this. And um, another example, let's say, u from r2 to r and I want to talk about the second derivative, right? So d2 of ux, how should it look like? It should look like u x1, x1, u x1, x2, u x2, x1, and u x2, x2. So that is called the Hessian of u. So this is obviously evaluated at the point x. So this is Hessian of u at x, okay? And you can actually define the most important operator which we are going to study in this course is the Laplacian of u. We write it like this. In some books it is, so uh, note in some books this is written like this. Laplacian is given by this, okay? This notation is wrong notation. This is the right notation, okay? Laplacian of u, this can be defined as the trace of d2 u. So this is essentially what I mean by this is x1 x1 plus x2 x2. So that's your Laplacian of u, right? u from r to r if it is given, d2 u will be defined like this. This is the Hessian matrix and Laplacian of u can be defined as the trace of the Hessian matrix which is given by this. Right, now with this, we are going to move on and define some other notations. So we are going to define something called the C omega. C omega are the set of all continuous functions. So this is u, let's say, from omega to r such that u is continuous. Okay? And similarly, you can also define C omega bar is a set of all those u in C omega such that u is uniformly continuous. Continuous on bounded subsets of omega. Okay, And what I mean by this is, see, first of all, let us understand what I mean by a point. Let's say, uh, so let us understand this. Let's say x is in on the boundary. x is on the boundary of omega. And we say u is continuous, continuous at x. What does that mean? I want to know. So what it means is, it means that given epsilon greater than 0, there exists delta positive such that u of x okay, minus u of y, this can be less than, this can be made less than epsilon for all y in omega bar intersection B x delta. Okay, so essentially, uh, I mean, if you just look at the uh, ball with center at x and radius delta, and you take the intersection with the closure of omega, for all those y's, ux and uy should be very close to each other. Okay, that is what I mean by a continuity of u at the point x where x is on the boundary. Now, when we say that u is in C omega bar, what I mean is u is a function in C omega such that it can be continuously extended till the boundary, okay? So, this can also be refreshed as refreshed as u C of omega bar is the set of all functions in C omega 
such that u admits a continuous extension up to the boundary okay till the boundary 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 okay so essentially note what it means is if omega is bounded is omega is bounded then this is the set of all uniformly continuous functions okay so e, e then u in c omega implies u is uniformly continuous right uniformly continuous okay and similarly you can also define ck of omega ck of omega ck of omega is the set of all those u from omega to r such that u is k times continuously differentiable okay k times continuous differentiable and ck of omega bar is similarly u in ck of omega such that dk of u u is uniformly continuous on bounded subsets of omega for mod alpha equals to k okay so for all partial derivatives of kth order and uh, of course we can also define we can also define c infinity of omega to be the uh, intersection of ck of omega k equals to 1 to infinity and c infinity of omega bar can be defined as intersection k equals to sorry this is k equals to 0 k equals to 0 k equals to 0 to infinity ck of omega bar okay so essentially you see you take uh, of course you can understand that uh, uh, c of omega contains c1 of omega and it goes on like this this is a nested thing right nested subset so you take the intersection of that thing and that will contain all functions which are infinity differentiable and you call all those functions as uh, smooth functions which is c infinity omega and c infinity omega bar are smooth functions up to the boundary so these are these are smooth functions up to the boundary clear right we also define this thing you guys already know but uh, let me again define it lp of omega so this we define as u from omega to r is measurable such that integral over omega module to the power p this is less than infinity so basically you are taking the uh, all the functions p summable functions okay for p greater than equal one but less than infinity okay so those are lp functions and we also define similarly l infinity omega so this is the set of all essentially bounded function what i mean by this is this is set of all those u from omega to r is measurable measurable such that essential supremum of u is less than infinity okay 
So this is L infinity functional. Now we start with something called a Cauchy inequality. Cauchy inequality. And uh, most of you know this inequality. So this says AB is less than A square by 2 plus B square by 2. Now it's very easy to see that why this is true. And this is true because uh, we all know that this is for a, B, E, R. Okay. Why this is true? This is true since uh, since A minus B whole square is always greater than equal 0. And that will give you this particular thing, right? So that's your Cauchy's inequality. This is the most basic form. And uh, there is another form which is a Cauchy's inequality. Cauchy's inequality with epsilon, okay, with epsilon. What that says is for epsilon greater than 0, for AB positive and epsilon greater than 0, one has AB less than equal epsilon A square plus B square by 4 epsilon. Okay? This can be proved using this. So essentially what happens is uh, you can use Cauchy's inequality to prove this Cauchy inequality with epsilon. You just replace. So AB, you see AB, you can write it like this. 2 epsilon to the power half times A and dot B by 2 epsilon to the power half. Once you do that, you can see that uh, AB can be written like this, right? And then you just put A square by 2 plus B square by 2, you get this epsilon uh, inequality. Right. So that's Cauchy's inequality with an epsilon. Now, let's look at another inequality. So this inequality is called Young's inequality. Young's inequality. Okay. What is the Young's inequality? It says that for P between 1 and infinity and 1 by P plus 1 by Q is 1, then AB less than equal. So this is A to the power P by P plus B to the power Q by Q. Okay. And uh, this is obviously we need A and B to be positive. Yes, this is very important. Okay, For AB positive, we can write AB is less than equal A to the power P by P plus B to the power Q by Q. Okay, so let's look at a quick proof of this. The proof involves the convexity of exponential x. So we know that fx equals to exponential x is convex, right? It's convex. So we'll use this property. So what we do is we write, let's say, ab. You can write it as exponential of log a plus log b, right? And that can be written as exponential of 1 by p log a to the power p plus 1 by q log uh, b to the power q. So these can be written as 1 by p exponential of log. So this is log, huh? um, base e. This is base e. Okay, log a to the power p plus 1 by q, okay, exponential log p to the power q, clear? Yeah. So this is uh, true because we are using the convexity argument. So this is given by a to the power p by p plus b to the power q by q, okay? And you see why we are using a b positive because otherwise I can't define these particular things, right? Log of a plus log of p. And this is the place where we are using a convexity. So how are we using it? We are using it like this. e power lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. Let's say this, okay? So f of this is less than equal. Uh, so lambda times exponential x 
plus 1 minus lambda times exponential y. Okay, this is what we get. Okay, so that's your uh, Cauchy's inequality and in the next part, what we are going to do is we are going to look at the Cauchy. Uh, this is the Holder's inequality, okay? Holder's inequality. So, Holder's inequality. So, what is Holder's inequality? What it says is, let's say, P and Q between 1 and infinity, okay, and 1 by P plus 1 by Q equals to 1. Then, if U is in LP omega and uh, V is in LQ omega, then integral omega u v dx this can be dominated by norm of u l p omega norm of v l q omega okay now let's look at the proof of this thing the proof is quite simple you can use homogeneity and we can assume so without loss of generality let us assume that norm of u P, norm of p q is 1 okay so let's let's just prove this thing for this uv so uh, for the unit uv norm of up equals to norm of vq equals to 1 and then we can look at the other thing so let's say this is if this is the case integral uv dx over omega this is less than equal 1 by p integral module to the power p dx plus 1 by q integral mod uh, v to the power um, q dx okay and this is 1 this is 1 and then it becomes 1 by p plus 1 by q and that will be 1 okay and this is norm u p norm v q okay so uh, you see, uh, this is true. So here I am using the you know Young's inequality. Okay, and now why can we use this thing that the norm u p and norm v q is one? So uh, because you see, if you take uh, let's say u and v are any arbitrary functions in L p and L q. Okay, you can actually assume u tilde to be u by norm u p and v tilde to be v by norm vq and then uh, you see then u tilde p v tilde q is 1 right and for this and for this u tilde and v tilde this is true this inequality is true so when you put it there then you will get this inequality right right okay so that's your holder inequality Another very important inequality which we are going to use is called the Minkowski inequality. This I am not proving, but this is also very simple inequality to prove. It says that for one less than t less than infinity and uv in lp omega we have norm u plus v lp omega less than equal norm u lp omega plus norm v lp Omega. Okay, so this is basically the final inequality in terms of norms. If you can uh, think of it like that, yes, this can this can be proved using uh, this uh, Young's inequality. Okay, but uh, I'm not going to prove it right now. So this you can just remember. Okay, now what we want to do is we want to from calculus.
so what i mean by this you see uh, generally whenever we are talking about this uh, pdes we say that uh, let's say some pd okay i don't know maybe uh, let's write it like f of uh, gradient du u x uh, this is some uh, relation that is equals to zero in let's say we say omega some domain, domain omega, which is let's say Rn, and as usual, we assume that omega is open and connected. And uh, you see, uh, we generally assume that omega is smooth, okay? Omega is smooth, or also in some books, they say del omega, which is the boundary of omega, is smooth now the question is this what is smooth what what do you mean when you say omega is smooth okay so we want to put it uh, properly in a definition definition so we say so obviously it is assumed that omega okay now uh, we will assume this thing omega is open and bounded bounded subset of Rn okay so we are giving this definition for open and bounded subset of Rn okay okay so what we are saying is let's say omega is open and bounded uh, oh, oh, sorry open and bounded subset of Rn yeah then then the boundary boundary del omega clear is ck is let's say c infinity yeah? let's start with c infinity c infinity is uh, this is what we say smooth smooth right c infinity if for every point if for every point x not on the boundary okay x not on the boundary there exist r greater than zero and a c infinity map okay let's say comma from r n minus one to r such that upon relabeling relabeling and reorienting reorienting the coordinates coordinates If necessary, we have so U intersection B X not R clear yes. this part of the domain is X in B X not R such that and X is the tuple X one X two X n right. So x n should be greater than gamma of x one x two x n minus one. Okay. Now what this means is what this means is you are basically saying that uh, so let us draw a small maybe you know diagram. Let's say that's your domain omega okay and this is r n minus one clear this is r n minus one but it essentially says is that now what is gamma gamma is this this is gamma so it is saying that uh, the graph i mean if 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 this you know, set is 
C infinity. So basically the boundary of the set is infinity. It means that the boundary is smooth. It means that you take any point on the boundary. Let's say this is the point on the boundary. Okay, let me put it in a different color. Uh, so, so this is the point in the boundary and you have a ball. You can have a ball around that. Okay, which is centered at that point. X not, let's say this is the point X not in the boundary. X not, and there's a ball around that such that the part, this part of the ball, okay, this, this part, so the intersection part of the ball with the domain is always above the graph of a C infinity function, okay? So this is, the, this is always above the graph of a C infinity function. So uh, for example, let's just uh, assume, so for example, let's say example, you see, if you take a unit ball, so unit ball, ball in Rn, definitely you, you can see that the unit ball in Rn is, I mean, you can obviously always find a, a function gamma so that this thing happens at every point on the unit ball. So this is a C infinity smooth domain or C infinity domain, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Of course, here I'm assuming open and bounded. Okay, so another example, let's see. So let's say as a domain which looks something like this. Let, let me draw it like this, a rectangle. So is it a C infinity domain? Of course, if you take these points and if you look at a you know ball around this point, of course, I mean, it is a C infinity domain, right? Because uh, I mean, you can reorient it and maybe look at it in this way. And uh, I mean, your domain, uh, your axis is like this, and it is always about the, the intersection, this part. This part will always be about the graph of a C infinity function. What is a C infinity function in this case? This one, right? Okay, so uh, the line. So in this case, uh, I mean, if you reorient this line like this here, then you can understand that the C infinity function. So if you reorient this line, okay, the axis, if you reorient the axis, you, you, you can think of this line as like this, okay? And uh, you have a axis like this, this axis like this. This is your Rn minus one, okay? And uh, the other part, this part, in this case, in this part is always above the graph of a C infinity function. What is the C infinity function in this case? This, this is line, right? So this is a linear map and uh, obviously this is C infinity and hence uh, this is a smooth domain. But it is smooth almost everywhere, not every, in any point. Because you see, if you let's just take this point or this point, any corner point, if you take a corner point like this, you see uh, the intersection. So this is, this is the intersection part, right? And uh, so it will look like this, no, intersection part. Intersection part, it will look like this. Huh? So and this is the axis. Now, let's say if you reorient it, you, you may think of this as looking like this, no? Okay. So you see uh, the graph is not, I mean, the, the intersection part, this, this part, okay, U intersection B. This is definitely not the graph of a C infinity function, okay? Not C infinity. So this is, this kind of domain is not a C infinity domain. You can understand that you can uh, uh, have the same definition by replacing C infinity with C1, and then you uh, just have to replace here with C1. This is, then we call it a C1 domain. So basically the boundary C1, if there is a C1 map which does all of this, okay? So you see, if you do that, then maybe you see, this is also not a CK, a C1 function, right? This is also not a C1 function. So this is mod X kind of thing. So this is Lipschitz continuous function. And we say this kind of domain, the rectangular domain, these are Lipschitz domains as per this definition. So Lipschitz, you just have to replace the boundary uh, C infinity with a Lipschitz. So the boundary is Lipschitz, and uh, Lipschitz is uh, for every point X not there exists that such that there exists and a Lipschitz map in this case. Eh? So if you just replace this definition with the Lipschitz definition, then this particular domain, this particular domain is a Lipschitz domain. But uh, 
ellipsis domain is this clear okay because uh, the graph is above a, uh, the intersection is above a ellipsis graph a graph of a ellipsis continuous function but not a c1 continuous function the intersection this intersection point the intersection region this is above the graph of a ellipsis continuous function okay but not a c infinity continuous function or c1 in that case so this is not even a c1 domain but it is of course a ellipsis domain okay so that's uh, how we deal with domain now so this is what we mean when we say it is a domain smooth domain now let us come to a very important thing which we call as the gauss green theorem okay and let me change the color so gauss green theorem what does that theorem say so first of all uh, omega obviously it is assumed to be open and bounded okay please uh, keep that in mind omega subset of rn is open bounded and smooth if you c1 of omega bar okay so essentially if omega is bounded c1 of omega bar consists of all uniformly continuous function so basically the uh, function is uniformly continuous the derivative the, uh, it has a derivative omega bar the derivative is continuous and not only continuous the derivative is also uniformly continuous so basically one time continuous is differentiable not only continuous differentiable the derivative function is also uniformly continuous okay right so this is the case then then this happens very very important this this is the one thing which you should know i mean you don't have to know anything else in this course you just have to know this thing huh? once you know this this is uh, everything is done so this is true usi over the um, domain omega df it's del omega u gamma i ds okay this holds for i equals to 1 2 n so what does that mean what is gamma gamma where gamma is gamma 1 gamma 2 gamma n is the unit outward normal to del omega okay so where see what uh, is saying is this if you take the derivative of u, the partial derivative of u, and if you are integrating it on omega, then that will give you, so you do not have to look at the whole domain to do that. You just look at the boundary of del omega, and you just compute u dot gamma i ds. That's done. I mean, once you do that, you calculate this thing, and this will give you your, I mean, evaluate uh, this particular thing, u x i over omega. And this ds, what is s? S is the surface measure, as we already did. Okay. So maybe I can just write it uh, del omega normal to omega and ds is the surface measure. So basically I am indicating it with respect to omega, right? So I need to use ds. Okay, now. Uh, so this is green gauss theorem i mean this is essentially your green theorem but in a more uh, useful form okay and of course you can just uh, use this thing to write this integral omega divergence of u okay dx equals to integral over the boundary u dot gamma ds clear so this holds for all vector field u cap in c1 of omega rn clear okay so this this holds and a very important property this property is this if you replace u with 
uv let's say okay so u and v both are in c1 let's say so the product is in c1 of omega bar now if you replace u with uv then what happens you have the integration bypass formula so that gives you uxi of v dx equals to integral over omega with a negative sign u v xi dx how, how are you getting this and see if you replace u with uv uv of xy by Lipschitz rule uxi of v plus vxi of u uxi of v plus vxi of u and you have a boundary term what is the boundary term plus integral over the boundary u v u is replaced by uv right uv gamma i ds okay gamma i ds and uh, this is for of course i equals to 1 to n and for all v in c 1 of omega bar clear so basically what i'm doing is i'm replacing u with uv see if you have two arbitrary function u and v in c1 of omega bar then the product of u and v is also in c1 of omega bar i'm just replacing u with uv so once you replace it it is u x i of v plus v x i of u this is what i wrote integral over omega that is equals to integral over the boundary u v gamma i ds that's what i wrote and this this is the most important formula which we are going to use in pds okay you don't know much about pds doesn't matter if you want to study about pds or the one thing which i want you to understand in this course is only this formula this is the most important formula okay integration this is called the integration bypass formula integration bypass okay this is your usual integration bypass in one dimension you know right and this is just the n dimensional version and you can obtain this thing using green gauss theorem right with this i think um, we can end this lecture